Dear aspirants, I am happy to bring to your attention that Shankarayas Academy is planning to launch two initiatives regarding your mains preparation. Under mains booster 2023, you will be provided 40 mains oriented tests in 90 days. The booster is a quick plan drafted for you to boost your main score. It starts on October 31st and will include sectional tests. Half papers and civil service examination emulators will also be provided. It is available in both online and offline modes for just 4,500 rupees. On top of that, we are launching a new initiative called SA Augmentor. Under this initiative, you will be provided with four tests to enhance your essays. It is also available in both online and offline modes. You will get a different approach towards essay writing along with pre-essay and post-essay discussions. To further enhance the content of your essays, you will be provided with a summarized essay material combined with mentorship. All these for just 6000 rupees. Grab this opportunity to kickstart your mains exam preparation and improve your main score. With this information, let me welcome you all to the Hindu news analysis for the date 22nd of October 2022. The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. With this, let's start our first article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It reports about the rare appearance of a great Indian bustard in Pakistan's Cholistan desert. Some environmentalists are speculating that these birds have migrated from India's Desert National Park, which is located in the Rajasthan state to Pakistan's Cholistan desert. Have a look at this map here. It shows the location of both the Cholistan Desert and the Desert National Park. See, this is a worrying news because it indicates two things. One is that this migration shows that the great Indian bustard habitat in India is shrinking. The next one is that the protective mechanism for the great Indian bustard in Pakistan is low. So they are susceptible to poaching there. This is about the news article. In this context, let us revise about the great Indian bustard. See, the great Indian bustard is one of the heaviest flying birds. These birds are endemic to the Indian subcontinent. They are primarily terrestrial birds. Generally, the males are taller and heavier than female birds. Also note that it is one of the rarest birds in the world. Most of the population are located in India. Very few birds are in Pakistan. In India, the largest number of around 150 is found in Thar Desert in Rajasthan, which nearly accounts for 95% of the global Great Indian Bustard population. Few birds are also sighted in Gujarat, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka. Now coming to the habitat of the birds. This species usually inhabits open habitats like inshot grasslands, open shrub and rain-fed agriculture fields. See, the Great Indian Bustard is a crucial indicator when it comes to grassland ecosystems. Now let's see about their breeding pattern. Great Indian Bustards breed in selected grasslands during the mating periods. The male display themselves to attract females. See, the males have a gular pouch. When they wish to attract females, they inflate the pouch. It helps them to produce a resonant booming mating call to attract females. The sound of the mating call can be heard up to a distance of 500 meters. An image of the great Indian bustard with its inflated gular pouch is given below for your reference. See how elegant the bird looks. This is all about the breeding pattern. Now coming to the reasons for the declining number of great Indian bustards. First reason is the habitat loss. This is what the article reports also. Then comes the poaching of the birds. Yeah, great Indian bustards are susceptible to poaching. After that, there is a predation of nests by foxes and feral dogs. Then finally comes the issue of power line collisions. See, these birds are prone to collision with power lines. This is because of their poor frontal vision and their inability to see power lines from a distance. Due to their larger size, it becomes difficult for them to maneuver or to shift trajectory quickly after seeing the power lines. Many a time, there is a huge impact with these lines and even if there is no electrocution, the birds die because of the impact of collision. Sometimes they die also because of electrocution. The habitats of Great Indian Bustard have a high density of transmission lines because of the potential for renewable energy production in Rajasthan and Gujarat. Finally, before ending our discussion, Let's see a few facts about this bird. This species is known for its very slow reproductive rate. It lays only one egg for one or two years. And the success rate of these eggs under ideal condition itself is around only 60% to 70%. 
Because of such very low reproductive rate and specific habitat requirements, the species is found to be highly vulnerable. If you can remember, in August this year, there was a news in the Hindu newspaper about Great Indian Bustard. The news was about captive breeding program in the Desert National Park. Since it was a rare occurrence, it was reported in the newspaper. Now, finally, let's see about the conservation status. Great Indian Bustard is listed as critically endangered by the IUCN. In India, it is placed under the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And finally, it is placed in the Appendix 1 of Sites. This is all with respect to Great Indian Bustard. Through this discussion, we have seen about the Great Indian Bustard, its habitat and why the population of Great Indian Bustard is not increasing. With this information, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this article. It says that Supreme Court refused to interfere with the Allahabad High Court's order that had previously dismissed a plea seeking probe into Taj Mahal's history. In this context, let's learn about Taj Mahal. As we all know, Taj Mahal was built by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to honor his wife Mumtaj Mahal. It is one of the seven wonders of the world. It houses the tomb of both Mumtaj Mahal and Shah Jahan. Taj Mahal is located in the banks of River Yamuna in the city of Agra. The mausoleum architecture takes inspiration from Indian, Persian and Arabic architecture. It was built out of white Makrana marble that was sourced from the Indian state of Rajasthan. Taj Mahal is located atop on an elevated square plinth that features four minarets standing at each of the four corners of the structure. The interior of the architecture is decorated with marble jelly works, calligraphy and pietra dura. Here, pietra dura is a decorative art form that involves inserting pieces of contrasting, often colored materials into depressions in a base object to form ornament or pictures. And jelly or pierced screens involves creating perforated slabs of stones. This was done during those times to ensure privacy and allow for airflow. This is about the Taj Mahal. But have you heard about mini Taj of Deccan? It is none other than BB Ka Makbara. BB Ka Makbara is located in Aurangabad district in Maharashtra. See, it is the burial place of Dilras Banu Begum, the first wife of Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. She was also known as Rabia Ud Durani. In 1660, Aurangzeb commissioned a mausoleum at Aurangabad to act as Dilra's final resting place, known as Bibika Makbara. In the following years, her tomb was repaired by her son Azamsa under Aurangzeb's order. It is an imitation of the Taj Mahal at Agra. You would have noticed this after looking at the pictures. Due to its similar design, it is popularly known as the Mini Taj of Deccan. An inscription found on the main entrance door mentions that this mausoleum was designed and erected by Atta Ullah, who was an architect working under Aurangzeb. Here, an interesting fact to note is that Atta Ullah was the son of Ustad Ahmad Lagauri, the principal designer of the Taj Mahal. With this, we have come to the end of this particular discussion. Through this discussion, we have briefly seen about Taj Mahal and also about the mini Taj of Deccan, known as Bibi Ka Makbara. With this, let's move on to the next article. Have a look at this opinion article taken from the yesterday's newspaper. See, this news article is a conversation between three eminent persons who discusses various aspects of SC status in India. Now suddenly, it is in news because recently, Union government formed a three-member commission of inquiry headed by former Chief Justice of India, Justice K.G. Balakrishnan. The purpose of this commission is to examine whether scheduled caste status can be accorded to Dalits who have converted to religions other than Sikhism and Buddhism over the years. So, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through some of the important points mentioned in the article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now, let's begin with the question, who are scheduled castes? See, scheduled castes are sub-communities within the framework of Hindu caste system. These communities have historically faced deprivation, oppression and extreme social isolation in ancient India. This was accorded to them due to their perceived low status in the caste hierarchy. If you are asking me what kind of historical oppression, I hope you all remember about the Varna system. In the context of Hinduism, Varna refers to a social class within a hierarchical caste system. 
it is nothing but a social stratification based on the varna that is the caste it has four basic categories which includes brahmin kshatriyas vaishyas and shudras so here know that the shudras are the one who were forced into work that predominantly involved sanitation disposal of animal carcasses cleaning of human excreta and other tasks that involved contact with unclean materials due to this the shudras were also referred to as untouchables they were prohibited from drinking water from shared water sources they cannot live in or use areas frequented by higher castes and they also faced social and economic isolation so often they were denied rights and privileges later the so called lower castes that is the shudras were termed as scheduled caste this was done for the first time through the government of india act 1935 the definition of the term scheduled caste was mentioned in part 14 of the act from then the same definition continued to be used by the indian government post independence as well i hope now you can get an idea for the question who scheduled castes are now coming to the question who decides upon the communities which are scheduled castes or not see the answer for this question is the president decides see article 341 of the indian constitution gives the president the power to notify which castes in the country and in specific states comes under the category of scheduled castes the article states that the president by issuing a public notification can deem a specific group or community as a scheduled caste remember according to the constitution order 1950 only marginalized hindu communities can be deemed as scheduled castes in india so here you can understand that our constitution itself provides several provisions to uplift and protect the rights of the sc communities the notable one among them is the provision that provide reservation to the community now let us have an overview about the historical background of reservations firstly know that william hunter and jodhirao phule were the first ones who originally conceived the idea of caste based reservation system in 1882 itself later the reservation system that exists today in its true sense was introduced in 1933 when british prime minister ramsay macdonald presented the communal award see the communal award was announced after the round table conference and it extended the separate electorate to depressed classes and other minorities that is the award made provisions for separate electorates for muslims sikhs indian christians anglo indians europeans and the dalits but the communal award was rejected by mahatma gandhi as he feared that the award would disintegrate hindu society by creating racial divide within the community he even went on a fast unto death against the communal award announced by the british government after long negotiations gandhi and ambedkar signed the pune pact it is in the pune pact where it was decided that there would be a single hindu electorate with certain reservations in it or in simple words the pune pact resulted in a joint electorate within an enhanced number of seats reserved for the depressed classes later after independence reservations were initially introduced for a period of 10 years and only for scs and sts but it kept on extending with several changes made to it for example in 1991 obcs were also included in the ambit of reservation after the recommendations of the mandal commission here you must know about the mandal commission see in exercise of the powers conferred by article 340 of the indian constitution the president of the day appointed a backward class commission in december 1978 which was under the chairmanship of bp mandal the commission was formed to determine the criteria for defining india's socially and educationally backward classes it was also given the duty to recommend steps to be taken for the advancement of those classes The Mandal Commission concluded that India's population consisted of approximately 52% of OBCs therefore 27% of government jobs should be reserved for them apart from identifying backward classes among Hindus the commission also has identified backward classes among non-Hindus here non-Hindus are Muslims and Christians it also generated an all india other backward classes list of around 3743 castes but later in the indra swani case of 1992 the supreme court while upholding the 27% quota for the backward classes struck down the government notification reserving 10% of the government jobs for the economically backward classes among the higher castes The Supreme Court in the same case also upheld the principle that combined reservation beneficiaries should not extend 50% of India's population. 
द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ क्रीमी लेयर ऑल्सो गेन्ड पॉपुलरिटी थ्रू दिस जजमेंट दट इज द जजमेंट मेड श्योर दट द रिसर्वेशन फॉर बैकवर्ड क्लासेस शुड बी कन्फाइंड टू इनिशियल अपॉइंटमेंट्स ओनली एंड नॉट एक्सटेंड टू प्रमोशंस रीसेंटली द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट एक्ट ऑफ ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन प्रोवाइडेड टेन पर्संटेज रिसर्वेशन इन गवर्मेंट जॉब्स एंड एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशन फॉर दि एकनामिकली बैकवर्ड इन दि अनिसर्व कैटगरी The Act amended Article 15 and 16 of the Indian Constitution by adding clauses empowering the government to provide reservation on the basis of economic backwardness. Remember this 10 percentage economic reservation is over and above the 50 percentage reservation cap which was introduced by the court during the Indira Gandhi judgment. So this is all about the historical background of reservations in India. I hope that you have an idea about the reservations now. Now let's understand about the Dalit Muslims and Dalit Christians and whether they should be given scheduled caste status or not to answer this question one among the eminent person who has given his opinion in the article said that all groups which are discriminated on the basis of their identity should be provided protection by law against such discrimination in that way he says that if dalit christians and dalit muslims are found to be discriminated then they should be provided with reservation now coming to the arguments which are against granting scheduled caste status for other religion people there must be an empirical study be carried out to understand the present condition of previous untouchables who have converted to christianity and islam without this empirical study no sc status should be granted to the christian and muslim dalits is the argument put forward another argument is that abrahamic religions doesn't have any social stratification within them unlike the hindu and this sc status is specifically suited for individuals who are within the hindu fold these are the two arguments put forward by some people who are against granting sc status for christians and muslims with this we have come to the end of our discussion Through this discussion we learned about the scheduled caste and also about the constitutionally granted reservation for them with these learned points now let's move on to the next article take a look at this news article it reports that india has successfully test fired indigenously developed new generation medium range ballistic missile called agni prime from the odisha coast so in this news article discussion let us understand the difference between cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and we shall also see some of the facts about the new generation medium range ballistic missile called agni prime see first of all a missile is rocket propelled weapon that is designed to deliver an explosive warhead with great accuracy at high speed missiles range from small weapons which are effectively only up to a few hundred feet to large strategic weapons that has got ranges of several thousand miles based on their type missiles are generally classified into cruise missiles and ballistic missiles see a cruise missile is a unmanned self propelled guided vehicle that sustains its flight through aerodynamic lift they generally fly within the earth's atmosphere and they make use of the jet engine technology since they have their own engine their path can be altered even after their launch famous example of a cruise missile is brahmos in contrast a ballistic missile is one that has a ballistic trajectory over most parts of its flight irrespective of whether or not it is a weapon delivery vehicle see ballistic trajectory means that the missile will move on a path under the influence of gravity they carry huge payloads and can be launched from both ship and land based facilities example of uh, ballistic missiles are prithvi 1 2 dhanush and agni here you must know the agni series see agni class of missiles are the backbone of india's nuclear launch capability it also includes the prithvi short range ballistic missiles submarine launched ballistic missiles etc agni missiles are long range nuclear weapon capable surface to surface ballistic missile know that the first missile of the series agni 1 was developed under the integrated guided missile development program and tested in 1989 its range was around 1000 km and it was developed by the famous defense research development organization after its success agni missile program was separated from the integrated guided missile development program upon realizing its strategic importance Currently there are 5 Agni series of missiles. The maximum range of Agni series of missiles is that of Agni 5. It has a range of around 5000 km. 
with this humongous range india can even target beijing the capital city of china the details of all the missiles belonging to the agni family are given here so kindly pause the video and go through the details now we shall see few important facts about agni prime see the agni prime also known as agni p is a medium range ballistic missile developed by the drdo it is developed as a successor for the agni 1 and agni 2 missiles agni p is a two stage canisterized solid propellant ballistic missile with dual redundant navigation and guidance system it has a range between 1000 and 2000 km here canister is nothing but the cylindrical container which holds the missile the missile comes with new composites propulsion systems and innovative guidance and control mechanisms besides the latest navigation systems and now it became the sixth missile in the agni series of ballistic missile family this is all with respect to the agni p missile through this discussion we came to know about the difference between the two types of missile system namely ballistic and cruise missiles also we learned about the agni missile family with these learned points now let us move on to the next article take a look at this ground zero report this article talks about the indian coffee industry and the issues affecting it the issues include increasing cost of production higher cost of credit low productivity less availability of skilled labor climate change competition from brazil and vietnam in global market high debt burden exploitation by traders highly volatile price and finally climate change associated issues like rise of new pest and diseases the article also gives some suggestions to address these issues first is to increase alternative source of revenues by employing intercropping and promoting green tourism next is promoting india's coffee brand identity in the global coffee market finally value addition to fetch premium price for the coffee seeds in india must be done this is all about the article in this context let us see some points about coffee cultivation in india first a little bit of history it is said that coffee was introduced in india during 1600 ad by the legendary holy saint baba budan the place where he planted the coffee seeds is now called as baba budan giri hills which is located in the southern district of karnataka the commercial plantations of coffee were started by the british entrepreneurs during the 18th century Since then the Indian coffee industry has made rapid strides and earned a distinct identity in the global coffee market. See India's current share of the global coffee market is around 5% and it also ranks 8th after Brazil, Vietnam, Indonesia, Colombia, Honduras, Ethiopia and Peru. Now let us see the climatic condition required for growing coffee. See coffee is a tropical plantation crop. it can tolerate temperatures ranging from 15 degree to 28 degree celsius it grows well in regions that receive around 150 to 250 cm of rainfall distributed over a period of 100 days this period must be followed by a continuous dry period of similar duration this dry weather is necessary for the time of ripening of the berries coffee requires well drained loamy soil for cultivation hence hill slopes are more suitable for the growth of this crop this is the main distinct feature of the indian coffee while coffee in brazil and vietnam is grown on a flat surface in india it is grown on slopes also note that indian coffee is grown in the shades nearly 50 different types of shade trees are found in the indian coffee plantations shade trees prevent soil erosion on a sloping terrain and also protect the coffee plant from seasonal fluctuations in temperature and play host to diverse flora and fauna now moving on to the distribution of coffee cultivation in india the plantations in the south are the cradle of indian coffee traditionally coffee in india is grown in karnataka kerala and tamil nadu where karnataka alone produces 2 thirds of india's coffee now the coffee cultivation is moving to new areas farmers in eastern ghats and the northeastern states are developing coffee plantations the araku valley arabica coffee from andhra pradesh and odisha recently got a gi tag finally what are the types of coffee that are grown in india see there are three varieties of coffee grown globally they are arabica robusta and liberica india mostly grows superior quality coffee which is nothing but arabica and robusta this is all regarding coffee industry in india through this discussion we came to know about the conditions required for coffee growth and also about the coffee industry in india with this we have come to the end of our today's discussion 
Now moving on to see the prelims practice question. Today I have taken two prelims question for discussion. Now coming to the first question. Let me read out the question. Which among the following Mughal rulers is associated with the peacock throne? The correct answer for this question is option C. Shah Jahan. We will see a few facts about peacock throne. See, it was first commissioned by Shah Jahan and it was constructed during his reign. The worth of the throne is calculated to be about two times the price of construction of Taj Mahal. Large amounts of solid gold, precious stones, and pearls were used, creating a masterful piece of Mughal workmanship that was unsurpassed before or after its creation. It was seen as an opulent indulgence that could only be seen by a small number of courtiers, aristocrats, and visiting dignitaries. During the reign of Muhammad Shah, the Mughal Empire was in decline. At that time, Nadir Shah of Iran invaded the Mughal capital city of Delhi. During the invasion, Nadir Shah returned to Persia with the peacock throne. Later, in 1747, Nadir Shah was assassinated by his own bodyguards. The peacock throne was dismantled by the looter and was sold off. Now, moving on to the second question. This is a previous year prelims question, so kindly pay attention. Let me read out the question. With reference to India's desert national park, which of the following statements are correct? Statement one: It is spread over two districts. This statement is correct because desert national park spreads over districts of Jaisalmer and Barmer in Rajasthan. So, statement one is correct. Now, coming to the second statement: There is no human habitation inside the park. This statement is incorrect because there is a human habitation present inside the borders of the park. So statement 2 is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement. It is one of the natural habitats of the great Indian bustard. About this statement we have seen briefly in the news discussion itself and the newspaper article also reports about this. So the statement is correct. So the correct option for this question is option C 1 and 3 only. Two prelims quiz question are displayed here. Interested aspirants can post the correct answer in the comment section. The mains practice question is displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. If you are liked our video, please hit the like button, do comment and share it with your friends. For further watching videos like this, please subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you.